So, hello everybody, my name is Chaim Weiss, I'm from the Department of Hebrew Literature at Ben Gurion University, and I think I'm probably the only one here who doesn't speak Yiddish at all, and I want to apologize for it. Um, we will start the second session, maybe we'll let people get in for a minute. Okay. We will start now the second session of this wonderful conference, which will be dedicated to avant-garde and Yiddish poetry, part one. Tomorrow we have part two, so this is only part one. I want to apologize on behalf of my friend Sabina Koller from Regensburg University. She could not make it, so we have only two lectures, which means that we have more time for discussion, questions, remark, friendly remarks. And uh, so um, let's move to the first uh, speaker. Our first speaker is Elaine Wilson. Now I'll read her short biography. Elaine Wilson is a PhD student at the Department of Slavic Languages at Columbia University. Her research focuses on Russian and Yiddish literature of the early 20th century. She is currently at work on her dissertation which draws upon the biblical book of Exodus as a theoretical model for, the understanding, for understanding their representation and articulation of the revolutionary theme in early Soviet literature, sorry. And the topic of her lecture is, let me see, Ascending to Hell, the Poetics of Deconstruction in Platonov and Malkish. So, please. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and um, apologies that I don't have it here on the slide. I found this image from a contemporary Ukrainian artist um, on Facebook, and I needed to actually do a bit of digging to then locate exactly um, who this is by, but it is by uh, the artist Igor Gusev, and it is entitled Series 3 World War 2022. Um, so it is a bit of a contemporary reference, but nonetheless, as you shall see, relevant to what I'm discussing today. Okay, so let's begin. Whirls of steel and glass lean and reach toward the heavens, simultaneously tilting and turning around internal cylinders housing a legislative body, a press bureau, and a radio station. This was the vision behind Vladimir Tatlin's Monument to the Third International. Begun in 1918, Tatlin's project developed in part through discussions with his friend and fellow innovator, the poet, mathematician, and linguist Vladimir Hlebnikov. Hlebnikov sought to develop a universal language, for he believed that such a system could prove to be the new vortex that unites us, the integrator of the human race. The swirling steel supports of Tatlin's tower rhyme with Klebnikov's vision of a unifying verbal vortex, their joint project, a Bolshevik Tower of Babel. And like Babel, Tatlin's tower was grandiose, ambitious, even precarious. In its very design, it keels dangerously to one side. It was perhaps inevitable that the tower was never built. Like Babel and all other utopian projects, it culminated in the only logical end, nowhere. The up-down tension of a vertical edifice, the tower, preoccupied many artists in the years immediately following the revolution. Two such artists, the Yiddish poet Piritz Markish and the Russian author Andrei Kotonov, likewise took up this image of a towering structure. Taking as points of departure Markish's poema, or long-form poem Dikupe, The Mound, and Platonov's novella Katlavan, The Foundation Pit, I will explore the contours of these authors' imagined edifices, breakdown, disintegration, reconstruction, and affordances of agency to spatial features constitute a common architectonic register that links these texts otherwise separated by time and genre. In both works, a towering structure, at once material and metaphysical, is subjected to the author's poetics of paradox, up becomes down, in becomes out, and the line between life and death is blurry, if extant at all. These texts manipulate space and language in order to speak to the anxieties of that most intimate spatial category, the body. 
and show how the body strives and suffers under rigid social and political frameworks. The architectural and bodily imagery of these texts then serves to first construct, then dismantle hegemonic structure. Marcus's poem, A Dicupe, is composed of 22 fragments that take a variety of poetic shapes from sonnets to couplets to irregular verse. This poem is a response to the violence of the Russian Civil War and the pogroms it generated, most specifically the massacre in Horodich, Ukraine in 1919. A work of Yiddish literature, Dikupa rages and wails in the language of the slain. The slaughtered victims in the verse are laid out one on top of the other, piled in a grisly mound that rails against the heavens. The companion piece in this study, Platonov's Foundation Pit, is a work of Russian prose that imagines a failed Soviet construction project. A massive skyscraper intended to house proletarian workers is never realized. Instead, the planned upward trajectory is reversed, and all that is ever built is a gigantic grave. Though separated by genre, these works share in a common project of breaking down linguistic structures and norms, a poetic stance that communicates and replicates the disorder of their real and imagined worlds. But the broken bricks with which they build these worlds are only the beginning. Let us now turn to their arrangement. And I start with Dikupe, which is a defiant response to catastrophe. It looks unflinchingly on the most abhorrent images of death so as to reject it. The poem opens upon a view of the titular heap, and a singular voice speaks for and from the grave. The bodies that form the mound ultimately prove to be both the object of the poetic gaze and the poetic voice. From a singular perspective to a grisly chorus, the lone speaker of the early verse ultimately transforms into many voices emanating from many mouths. These mouths are important, not just for what they say, but for what they do. These gaping mouths form the structure and significance of the heap itself. They are voids that blaspheme. Much of the scholarship on this poem, most notably that of Roy Kleinwald, David Roskies, and Seth Wollitz, has attended to the poem's play with the sacred and profane. <clears throat> what is most interesting for the study here, however, is the role of the mouth as orifice, as empty space. Wollitz observes that Markish demonstrates the vacuity of sacred forms, and just as tension is generated by oppositional force, the negative space of Markish's mouths facilitates self-cancellation. In one example from the poem's third sequence, the poetic voice addresses the divine and expresses a wish to, quote, lock myself in prayer with you and move my lips and move my heart, reviling, cursing, and blaspheming, end quote. Markish turns the oral act of connection into oral gestures of rejection. And orifices are everywhere. The shape and significance of the oral utterance echoes throughout the poem's imagery. We have the hollow of a useless overturned wagon, Earth's black thigh is marred by a gash, and the poetic voice invites the mad wind to scrape out whatever it desires from the mound of bodies. Markish's imagery is an abundance of absence. The mound spills out, then contracts upon itself. In sequence five, the mound freely gushes, quote, from her crazed crimson out upon the seas and beyond, end quote. The vertical mass of the heat breaks down and disperses. Like Babel, the vertical ceases and begets movement across a horizontal plane. Yet this horizontal movement ultimately resumes an up-down trajectory. The mound transforms into a single hollow cavity. Near the poema's conclusion in sequence 20, it transforms into a massive, thirsting, red-hot crater. All those mouths, gashes and wounds, gaping and oozing, come together to generate a thick void that swallows and compresses all it takes in. Everything, that is, save for the Ten Commandments, which the mound crater spits back to heaven. Wollitz has noted how self-cancellation of contradiction is achieved largely through the poem's preoccupation with consumption. He writes, quote, All the archetypal imagery becomes personified, simplified, and assimilated into a gigantic consuming mouth. The rhetoric reduces all objects to one function, anthropomorphic consumers, and creates claustrophobic pressure, end quote. I believe this pressure is crucial. The vertical mass of the heap, allegedly a protrusion, is paradoxically constructed through expressions of empty space, and thus the suggestion of a convex structure proves to be concave. Returning then to the single poetic voice that breaks away into many, the inversion of space taken together with the act of compression through constant consumption suggests a kind of implosion. 
Like a black hole, the singular explodes only to collapse in on itself. Roskies writes, quote, the poetic eye has no biographic past. He is society at large or every eye reading the poem, end quote. I agree, though I do not so confidently employ the pronoun he, in large part because of the omnipresence of orifices. These concave sites, gashes, mouths, craters, all form the distinctly feminine Malka Kupa or Malka Bark. Markish unambiguously genders the paradoxical crater mound that spits at the heavens as female. Dikupa is inseparable from the historical context in which it was composed, one of ever increasing violence. Jewish bodies bore the brunt of this violence, certainly, perhaps even especially, the female body. Elisa Bempera's research on the pogroms of the Russian Civil War highlights the atrocities of sexual violence against women, which was often carried out in public and was an all too common feature of the pogroms, for nearly every report contained reference to sexual violence. Keeping in mind this historical reality, the exposure and exhibition of the, body, of the bodies of the mound and their orgy of agony support a gendered reading of Markish's verse. Indeed, I embrace the distinctly gendered gesture of the Malkabarg. Flinging the Ten Commandments back to heaven, this queen heap enacts a gendered outcry of defiance that is twofold. It rejects both the anti-Jewish violence of the pogroms and the impotence of patriarchal order. In its conflation of religions, space, and time, the poetic voice invokes and intertwines distinct patriarchal traditions, Allah, Christos, Shaddai, conjoining them on the heap. And over all these patriarchal traditions rises the queen heap, an alternative order, von Goda Welt, von Erden und von Finlen, von Malke über alle Berg, will ich dich Kupe kreunen. Thereafter come the final throes of the patriarchy, Läuft eus pompen von sich die letzte Tropen schimmeldicke Säre und huliet ob wie alte Ewe botteldicke Sultane reiche. The grotesquerie of an orgy of mad old men is a reflection of the madness of an ineffectual old order. The poetic voice points to not only the impotence of these systems, but also their finality. Proliferation is impossible. These old and oafish Sultane can only spill the letzte Tropen of their semen, which has already spoiled. To clarify my argument, I enjoin Sarah Ahmed's theory of queer phenomenology to reorient and reconsider de Kupa's resistance to history and tradition. Ahmed writes that, quote, the normative can be described in terms of the straight body. A body appears in line. Things seem straight on the vertical axis when they are in line with other lines. But when even one thing comes out of line with another thing, the general effect is wonky or queer. The impulse then to make straight and to find vertical alignment is to pursue the normative, where normative is that which is the effect of the accepted repetition of bodily actions over time. This effect, by another name, might be called tradition. Ahmed encourages a redirection of attention towards different objects, especially those that deviate or are deviant, in order to read for the angle of the writing and offer a different slant to the concept of orientation itself. Thinking through the concavity of the supposedly upward heap, then, the normativity of verticality dissolves, making space for a non-normative, that is, queer, perspective on the text. And so, where Greenwald posits interruption of martyrological legacy as penetration of the cycle of violence, I instead embrace the metaphor of dismemberment to highlight the crumbling of the edifice, almost a kind of castration. Greenwald asserts, nothing in the poem escapes dismemberment. And my reading extends this to the force of history itself. Markish's inversion of the upward, the queen crater Kupe, precludes further erection of that morbid edifice. All those bodies piled up following the triumph of the revolution are subsumed, swallowed, and called into the crater in a conclusive act. Platonov's edifice, like Markish's, cannot stand. In fact, it never even gets off the ground. <coughs> Written between 1929 and 1930, the foundation pit is one in a long line of Platonov's literary construction projects yet the least productive. The failure of construction in the foundation pit might be considered the maturation of Platonov's philosophy of entropy. Like in Markish, visions of ascent are tempered by destruction. However, the forward-looking anti-lament of Dikupa in 22 does not find an unchanged, zealous echo in Platonov's text of 1930. 
The foundation pit is more explicitly mournful, a lamentation on all that was inhumed by Stalin. What did I, I'm sorry if I skipped this. This is one cover that we have for this, for this text. Uh, the structure of the foundation pit aligns to a large degree with the Soviet production novel, and this is here why I have these two texts on display. Uh, the Soviet production novel was the dominant genre of the late 20s and early 30s. However, the novella fails, that is, Platonov's novella, fails to achieve two key features of the production novel. First, and most damning, it is ideologically compromised. Platonov's characters search for the meaning of life and do not find it. Here we have an illustration of uh, Voshev, a character I'll mention in a second. Uh, life requires conscious effort to persist. This character, Voshev, decides somehow to keep on living, while another laborer, Kozlov, feels, quote, how hard it was for his heart to keep on beating and therefore finds it necessary to stroke his hands over his bones, now and again during work, and in a whisper, urge endurance, end quote. This perverse physicality is of a piece with Platonov's second deviation from the production novel, the inability and unwillingness to portray man's domination over nature. Nature is frequently presented as a site of great power. It is not, however, a power to be harnessed or dominated, but rather to be respected, to learn from and gain from, and even to which one might return. Uh, one laborer, Chiklin, does not overcome the earth in the excavation process. Instead, it is he who is overcome. Quote, not feeling thought, he lumberingly breaks up the earth with his pick, his flesh becoming exhausted down there, end quote. His comrade, Kozlov, likewise does not perform feats of proletarian strength. Instead, what power he possesses passes back into the earth. Quote, the exhausted Kozlov worked with no recollection of time and place, releasing the remnants of his warm strength into the stone which he was cleaving. The stone grew warm, and Kozlov gradually grew cold, end quote. Platonov looks to the physical reality of building socialism in order to demonstrate that the social body is the body proper. While for Markish, the body is a means of articulating structural anxieties, those mouths that are both method and material, for Platonov, the body is the locus of consequence. And if Markish, writing in 1922, is like a prophet projecting the beginning of a new order, then Platonov might be said to show the unfulfillment of that prophecy, the inability to escape the violent cycle. Stalinism and its policy of collectivization were meant to usher in the end of history, the out-of-time utopia of a true communist society. Here I um, point again to these production novel covers where we see this sort of joyous celebration of utopia in contrast to our moody uh, Platonov uh, character here. The fatigued and famished characters of Platonov's fictional landscape cannot properly envision or understand the promise of future paradise, including the chief engineer of the construction project, Prushevsky. This predicament recalls Boris Groy's theory of the avant-garde. Groy asserts that the avant-garde artists sought to usurp the place of God, thus transcending the world of their creation and leaving the artist no place in it. Groys writes, quote, although he creates a new world, the avant-garde artist remains in the old one, in the history of the arts and tradition. Rather like Moses on the threshold of the promised land, his projection of the new is merely logical, formal, and soulless, for his soul is still in the past, end quote. And so, likewise, Prushevsky, the supposed engineer artist of the future, cannot mentally and emotionally enter into the promised land. Indeed, all of the characters of the foundation pit are caught in such a trap. Nostalgia infects Platonov's world, thus frustrating any kind of future. The tension between hope and hopelessness and the articulation of these anxieties are located, as we have seen, in the body. However, I believe that it finds its most acute expression in the female body. While for Markish, the female form is implicit, in Platonov it is explicit, and it is the locus of consequence of systemic violence. Early in the novella, an all-girls pioneer orchestra marches past. These girls smile, yet, quote, any one of these pioneer girls had been born at the time when dead horses of social warfare were lying on the fields, and not all had possessed skin at the hour of their origin, since their mothers were being nourished only by the reserves of their own bodies, end quote. These girls, therefore, carry the imprint of death, even in the flower of their youth. And once these girls have passed, a veteran of the Civil War tells Voshev, a man who's never seen war is like a woman who's never given birth. 
In the post-Civil War moment, the struggle with death and life and birth are, in a sense, the new battlefield. This struggle is manifest in the child, Anastasia or Nastya, a young girl taken in by the laborers. Nastya is attended by death and life by virtue of her orphanhood, a common tragic state for characters in Platonov. She is the locus of tension between the promise of futurity and the finality of death, the aforementioned threshold to the Soviet promised land. Yet Platonov undercuts any hope that Nastya holds. She sleeps in a coffin, and she suffers from the elements, for Soviet society has not yet yoked the natural world to its will. Thomas Seaford puts it succinctly, quote, that Nastya dies and is buried in the pit is the preeminent symbol of utopia's failure, end quote. Like a pair of perverse bookends, the mother-daughter imagery of the opening pioneer passage is complemented, indeed completed, by the death of Nastya's mother and then Nastya herself. In a morbid echo of the pioneer girl's prenatal nourishment, Nastya succumbs to death once she receives her mother's bones. This violent cycle, indeed overlap of birth and death born by Platonov's female figures, highlights the violence of the particular patriarchal hegemony under which they live and labor. These, excuse me, those patriarchal traditions that were under attack in Markish are concentrated into the singular father figure of Platonov's reality, the grand architect of Soviet utopia, Stalin. In Markish, the collapse of space and time, the concave made convex and the dead made animate, are dynamic aesthetic gestures. This dynamism is suggestive of a kind of oppositional propulsion, one that refuses logic and natural law, and in its process of self-cancellation takes up and takes down the force of historical violence. Dikupa highlights the destructive forces at work within the greater social edifice, expressing the gravity of the situation as gravitational force. Up is tempered with down, mound collapses into crater. Oozing, spitting, and otherwise expunging the trappings of tradition, the mound rejects its old foundations, transforming into the hollow of a foundation pit upon which the new social edifice might be reconstructed. Platonov, in his turn, further excavates these foundations, yet finds the plan for progress is still based upon violence. And so, the project continues on, out, and down, but never up. Though the citizens of the new Soviet world are instructed to lift their gaze upward, above, and beyond the horizon, Markish and Platonov, in their complementary deconstruction of space, topple this official Soviet perspective. Dikupa and the foundation pit reconsider and reorient the positionality of the Soviet body. It is only ever looking up from the edge of the pre- it is only ever looking up from the edge of the precipice or from within it. Thank you. So we have a little bit, not a little bit, we have time for questions, remarks, so please believe. Anybody? Yes, please. Um, thank you, Adam. I don't know how to read the last one. Spasiba. Um, um, this is a very, very, first of all, beautifully written, but also very productive juxtaposition. I mean, there's a lot here. There are a couple of ideas, because we got time, you know, uh, uh, that I'd like to um, maybe elaborate on or ask you to elaborate on. Um, one, I think that the, these two texts really illustrate something that I'm really, really fond of repeating. Um, that, you know, specifically with Yiddish, there's no such thing as secular Yiddish. And I think that's true for Platonov as well. That, you know, that even in the era of the Soviet Union, one is um, just saturated with religious ideas. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I would ask you maybe to elaborate on is the significance of sacrifice in these two uh, uh, works that you know, we have an understanding of sacrifice as investing in death a, a capacity for regeneration. And that's definitely an idea I think that Platonov is playing with in the foundation uh, uh, pit, presumably to deny or foreclose this. This is a sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice that doesn't lead to any rebirth. It leads to more death. Something similar is going on in Marcus, but also quite, quite differently. 
because of the historical circumstances in which these two works were conceived. And that brings me to the other question that I'd, last, I, that I'd like you to elaborate on, if you could, about the role of technology. Um, in Platonov, this is a very technological novel, in, or novella, or prose work, in exactly the context that you refer to. It's a maybe a parody, maybe a pastiche, maybe a deranged uh, imitation of the construction novel. Mm -hmm. um, so technology is very much highlighted in, the, in its mechanics and its, in its poetics. With Markovic, this is just slaughter, right? What about the sequel that Markovic creates, which is radio, which is all about technology? And is that another correspondence There's so much here. Thank you. Um, so, in, you talk about the the lack of secularism when we're looking at these texts, and I think um, that is such a productive point. Not only because of the fact that um, you know there's there's the debate like was Markish actually religious or not. Many scholars are insistent like you know he was quite atheist, etc. But his wife was like, no, he definitely had religion. Regardless, he's playing with with all of these things because they are such potent imagery. Um, and Platonov is doing the same, and um, I'm going to highlight more of this architecture, not just because it's relevant to my work here, but because of the fact that um, I think it will eventually bring us around to um, this idea of, of, of technology and then the sequel in radio. And um, if we look at Platonov's early writing and his early years, when he is like he is truly a proletarian writer, you know, he comes from a fairly like poor family. He is you know working on trains, loves trains. You know, what's more proletarian than that? Um, serves at the front with the Red Army, and he's writing in um, Voronezh all of these articles for um, like fellow proletarians arguing that they should come together and create this, um, what am I trying to say, this sort of poetic group that's going to devise a new literature, a new proletarian literature. And in the process of writing these articles, he keeps coming back to two things. Um, he talks about edifices, like this like building of socialism. I mean, that was, the, that was the mandate at the time, right? But he also was relying on religion. So even though he wasn't raised in a religious home, he's still looking at these structures, both as a system and as a physical edifice, and trying to talk about the ways that there may be a hindrance or um, even a, like a mechanism for articulating what we're supposed to do. He has this one article, um, Christos and we, like Christ and us, in which he talks about all of like the Soviet people who are like impoverished, famished, famine's a big thing for him, um, in, in this church praying to a dead God while the building falls down around them. And in this moment, he's, I think this is actually from 1919, so he's still quite taken with the Soviet project. <laughs> By the time we get to 1929, 1930, he's using the same mechanisms to articulate the same anxieties, but now he's not really on board. And so I think that this, um, uh, the secular versus uh, religious tension is just always there because this is ultimately a matter of faith regardless of which system you're engaged in. And on top of that, we have this technology that's supposed to be the new saving grace, um, but particularly in um, the foundation pit, you, you don't really see any kind of any kind of industrial presence. It's much more people with hammers. Or, um, you know, we have even the bear, which I think is a very, um, a very common uh, Touchstone when we talk about this novel, there's this bear that is like breaking stones and then has to go around and like get rid of all the kulaks. And it's just, there's much we can say about sort of the dehumanization of people under the system that this bear is now the one who's doing the labor of going through all these things. Um, so, technology in Platonov at this point, it's, it plays a big role in his earlier text, certainly. He actually did work in Central Asia, building irrigation systems in the desert. So you see it there as this hopeful piece. But by the time that he has um, become much more disenchanted with the Soviet project, it almost turns to this primitivism. 
Now, I will say um, radio, I am still working through it. That is a piece of the dissertation too. It must be, right? Um, but I still think that, um, and maybe that's just by virtue of the fact that we're still in like the early 20s, um, we still have like horses and fields and, and many of these other sort of agrarian themes or much more folkish themes that are in tension with this radio. So it, but I mean, it, it is, again, to kind of bring it back to Tatlin's Tower and this idea of this radio tower at the very top broadcasting messages to the world, what he is thinking about in talking about bringing the message, um, the centrality of Moscow and the communist project out into the fields. But technology there is, again, more of a, a piece of faith as opposed to a reality. It's also a collision of temporality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that. I will stop rambling. We have time for like, two or three questions. Oh, goodness. Uh, likened to a uh, fight. Uh, fight, you know, it's like uh, bison a fight. It's also fig. Mm -hmm. It's also a fight, which means uh, like uh, to, uh, to show a finger. Yeah. You know? So if you, if you will agree, let us say that it's a, it's a malke, it's a, it's a queen, but yet a phallic one. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard to... I mean, this whole gesture of like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, stabbing the, uh, the skies should be, yeah, it's kind of like everything. I completely agree. And um, something that I realize I haven't done um, possibly as well as I could have in this text is I'm leaning upon this queer reading because I think it contains these, these things, right? We're not just looking at, um, you know, the female, I think that there's much to be said for maybe taking patriarchy and sort of turning it on its head, and there's, there's a binary there, certainly. But yes, you're absolutely right, there's so much that is phallic, it is a mound and a crater at once. And in the process of spitting back the Ten Commandments, this is a kind of expectoration or ejaculation, if you like, but from within a hollow, like a concave place, so he's really just Blowing your, you know, blowing your mind with all of these things that are contradictory at the same time. So you're absolutely right. I will make a point of highlighting the finger raised to the heavens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much.